In Galatians 2, 11 to 14, Paul dramatically makes one more point concerning his independence from the apostles in Jerusalem, Peter in particular in this case. Only here the point isn't so much to underline his independent independence as it is to clarify and launch into the rest of the epistle where he makes clear his gospel. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him, there's Paul's independence, to his face because he was condemned, self-condemned, his behavior condemned him. We'll come back to that. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Peter was eating with the Gentiles, Cephas. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself from his fellow Christian Gentiles, fearing those of the circumcision. So the, those who came from James, the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with Cephas, Peter, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Barnabas, who had gone with Paul up to Jerusalem and had put the a stake in the ground regarding whether Titus was required to be circumcised. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, they were acting by pulling back from fellowship with the Gentiles and refusing to eat with them as they had been, they were acting not in step with the gospel. The gospel was being obscured at best, or contradicted. I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, he had been eating with the Gentiles, so he was free, Peter was free, to eat with Gentiles and not worry about the Jewish kosher laws. And not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So, Father, as we ponder this living out of step with the gospel and the rebuke that Paul has to bring to Peter, would you grant us to understand what's at stake here, what's in step with the gospel, how we can bring our lives more fully into line with behavior that accords with the gospel. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When Cephas came to Antioch, so we don't know the situation, but here he comes to Antioch, where Paul is on his more or less home territory, I had to oppose him to his face because he was condemned. Now, why was was he condemned? And this word condemned here might mean simply condemned of a particular guilty act, or it might have the larger connotation of condemned absolutely. Meaning, if you go on in this way, Peter, if you continue to act in this way, you'll show you're not even a Christian. Or it might be not drawing attention to something that dramatic, but simply saying, this act of walking out of step with the gospel, you're condemned of that act. You need to repent of that act. For before, certain men came from James. So we don't know who these people are, and we don't know whether they were really authorized by James and represented James. It's hard to believe that they truly represent James, because remember, uh, in the previous paragraph, It was James and Cephas and John who gave the right hand of fellowship to uh, Paul and Barnabas, and that means that they affirmed their freedom to preach the gospel of grace apart from works of the law. So there had been total harmony in theological position here. And so when men come from James and Peter's afraid of them, that would be strange if they really represented what James believed when James and Peter and and John and Paul and Barnabas were in such agreement. So I'm inclined to think these men who came from James were not in total sync with James, but probably are the party who are at least close to Where is it? 
false brothers here in verse 4. False brothers secretly brought in. So I don't know for sure who these men are and what they actually believed, but they frightened Peter so much that he started walking out of step with the gospel. So men came from James. Peter was eating with the Gentiles. So Peter was acting in consistency with his position in giving Paul the right hand of the fellowship to preach that gospel to the Gentiles and not require circumcision or the agreement with the the kosher laws and so on. So Peter was acting in freedom as a Jew to eat with Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing. This kind of reminds us, doesn't it, of Peter's three denials of Jesus. Not quite as serious as that, I suppose, but he hasn't completely gotten over his need for the protection or the approval of other people. And so the disapproval of this group of people frightened him. He didn't want to get criticized by this Jerusalem contingent, those of the circumcision. And here's what else happened, which shows you the power when leaders go off the rails. Look how many other people go off the rails. The rest of the Jews acted hypocritically. Pause over that for just a second. It's a remarkable use of the word hypocrisy. Ordinarily, in the Gospels, when Jesus condemns hypocrisy, he's condemning people who are rotten on the inside, but are putting up a good front on the outside, so they're pretending that they are better than they are by acting in good ways while they are full of greed on the inside. But here, Uh, Peter was doing well. He was acting in consistency with the gospel as he ate with the Gentiles, and now he starts acting badly. (laughs) And that's called hypocrisy. So hypocrisy is Peter putting up a bad front to conceal a good theology. Crazy, right? So at least hypocrisy here means your inside commitments to the gospel that you agreed upon down there in Jerusalem with the right hand of fellowship and your present behavior are totally out of sync right now. And you are giving to this group here one impression while you were giving a different impression to this group here. And this was right. And along with him, they all acted hypocritically and even Barnabas who was part of that right hand of fellowship, and who is Paul's right-hand man, was led astray by their hypocrisy. So just go to school on how powerful it is when a celebrated leader like Peter goes off the rails. You got all kinds of other people going off the rails, and you have people who ought to know better in leadership following them. Now, Paul comes through in his true independent colors. When I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Now, let's just stop here for a minute. How was it not in step with the truth of the gospel? The gospel, so far and later in this letter, will be largely about getting justified by faith alone apart from works of the law, including circumcision and and dietary laws from the Old Testament. Is, Is that what's going on here? Because these are all Christians, right? He's eating with fellow Gentiles. Peter is eating with with Gentile Christians. And so they're all justified by faith. So either this out of step with the gospel means, no, if you let your 
old commitments to uh, legal principles that you had not depended on to get right with God start to keep you out of fellowship with other Christians, you will be communicating that your initial ignoring of those legal stipulations was wrong, and you're going to go back on your gospel. And so this is very, very serious that the gospel itself is being undermined. Or here's another possibility. Over in chapter 3, what's at stake in this book is not merely how you get justified, but how you go on to maturity. Look at these verses. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of law or by hearing with faith? Now, that's the beginning of the Christian life, right? And it begins with faith, not by works of the law. You received the Spirit. You were saved, not by works of law, but by hearing with faith. Are you so foolish, having begun your Christian life by the Spirit? Are you now being matured or perfected by the flesh reliance upon law? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it is in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you now and works miracles among you now do so by works of the law? No, but by hearing with faith. So at stake in this book is not only how we get right with God at the beginning. Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit, but also how you go on toward maturity and perfection. So it could be that what Paul is criticizing by saying they're out of step with the gospel here is not so much that they have undermined the gospel of foundational justification by faith, but that they are undermining the gospel of sanctification by faith. Now, we'll have lots more to say about that when we get further on. But either way, the gospel is seriously compromised by Peter, and he sums it up here, how that's happening. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile. Now, that was good, right? He was eating with the Gentiles. Eating with the Gentiles. And now, he describes that as living like a Gentile, which is gospel freedom, and not like a Jew, even though you are a Jew. How can you force? Now, remember that word from where did we see it? Remember here. But even Titus, who was with me down in Jerusalem, was not forced to be circumcised. So Peter and James and John had all agreed. Don't force the law on Titus. And here, Paul is saying, Peter, your behavior amounts to a forcing of the Gentiles whom you are leaving to live like Jews. You are communicating. If you really want to be a mature Christian, you want to be a real Christian, a first-class Christian, or maybe a Christian at all, you've got to pull back from eating pork, or not washing your hands, or failing to be circumcised. And Paul says that communication to the Gentiles is out of step with the gospel. And this launches him in the coming paragraph into the rest of the book and the effort to make the gospel as plain as he can possibly make it.